I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, and uh, <laughs> okay, let's start all over again. <laughs> and I apologize to those on the call. Uh, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, we're a nonprofit uh, advocating for fast, frequent, and dependable trains. We strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source in North America of how, what high speed rail is, why we should build it, and what steps local leaders need to make it happen, need to take to make it happen. Um, and we provide you and others like you the tools you need in order to educate your folks in um, uh, state capitals or in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are advocating for the integrated network approach where high speed lines, regional lines and shared use lines work together to uh, connect entire regions, both urban and rural communities. Um, and we're working to build the strongest movement there is to make sure we have a strong federal program uh, to expand passenger rail across the entire country. Um, we do this because um, it's a much more attractive way to travel. Um, and if people are, are traveling without their cars, um, we can um, have much more walkable and financially stable communities. But it all starts with that passenger. So, um, uh, how are the passengers going to use the service? What is it they, they want, et cetera? So I'm very excited today to have a couple of speakers from uh, uh, DB Consult in order to talk about that subject. And Chris uh, is our uh, deputy director out of Madison. Chris, please introduce our speakers. Will do. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so uh, DB Engineering Consulting and Operations North America serves as the early train operator or ETO for the California High Speed Rail Authority. And today we have two representatives uh, as speakers. Uh, Madeline Rodriguez serves as lead commercial advisor where she has responsibility for developing operations and maintenance cost forecasts, uh, as well as overall commercial strategy for system development. She's a financial and business management professional with more than 20 years of experience, including 15 years in the passenger rail industry. Her prior experience includes working as director of finance and business administration with a global rolling stock manufacturing company, uh, large scale project execution with international teams to deliver rolling stock projects on time and within budget, contract and risk management, and leading commercial business development activities. She had earlier career experience in audit and accounting positions in the banking and global engineering and construction industries, and she is passionate about high-speed rail, as are we. Uh, Mr. Stefan Royal, our second speaker, serves as lead transportation expert for the ETO. He has a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Stuttgart and is a transportation planning expert whose experience includes investment grade forecasting projects, service planning, financial analysis, feasibility assessments, benefit cost analysis, as well as long-term strategic planning studies. He currently leads ridership and revenue forecasting and planning studies for his company's contract with the California High Speed Rail Authority. And during his consulting career of 26 years, he spent 10 years working in Germany and has overall worked for more than 18 years on transit and rail projects. So uh, we will turn things over to our speakers in, in just a moment. Um, I want to just say a word about uh, comments and questions. If you have uh, comments during our, our talk today, please use the chat feature in Zoom. And if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, tool that Zoom provides. And when the presentation is over, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. So thank you all for coming and let me turn things over to Madeline and Stefan. Great, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Chris, for having us. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, did that come up okay? Yes. All right, wonderful. Focus on passengers' perspective and their experience is critical for any successful rail operation. 
The passenger's preferences, their attitudes, emotions, and behavior will inform the rolling stock design, station design, customer services, and fare policy. In this session, we will discuss those components which influence passenger travel behavior and how to reflect this in our service offerings. We need to measure travel behavior so we know where we are and where we are going. It's important to note that this is an iterative process because demographics and market conditions do change over time. Let's take a look at factors which influence travel behavior. Some are not within our control, such as the different personas who will ride and the purpose of their trip for either commuting to work, visiting family or friends, traveling for recreation, school, or to special events. The purpose of the passenger's trip will influence how frequently they travel, as well as the amenities they will look for at stations or inside the trains. These different personas are a lens through which we can see and plan for targeted service offerings and amenities with these customer-facing assets. Another factor influencing travel behavior are demographics, such as gender, age, and employment status, amongst others. It's about recognizing that these differences will result in different preferences and therefore being able to plan for this in service offerings. The point of origin and destination speaks to the demographics attributed to different geographies, which will as well result in different passenger needs. In our experience, we've seen in the past that the majority of trips from suburbs used to terminate in downtown. Over time, the patterns changed and people moved further out to afford cost of housing, and the city destinations became more polycentric, meaning people are traveling longer and to new destinations than the original system was designed for. With that change and the longer trip times, riders like to spend the trip time productively and enjoy amenities while traveling. And with this change, therefore, the user experience at the stations and in the trains became even more important to riders. So with that now, let's focus on what is within our control. And here, customer experience is a major focus. More specifically, think of this like a pyramid. The foundation starts with providing the basics of safety and security, because who will ride a train if they don't feel safe? So we want to ensure that constant and consistent presence of security and policing is there. The next level in the pyramid is operations. And by this, we are referring to the attractive service plans we can provide that meets the needs of frequency and trip time. As well, it's about the performance and reliability of the whole system. Next is service, and this is where focus groups and surveys can help with our understanding of passengers' preferences for targeted amenities and services at uh, stations and trains. The last and at the top of this pyramid are emotions. When someone speaks negatively or positively about any experience, it's because the person always remembers how the experience made them feel. In the case of travelers, did they feel relaxed and stress-free from the start to the end of their travel journey? Was it easy to access from other modes of transportation? Was the price perceived as reasonable for what they received in exchange? In summary, when we understand some of the factors which influence travel behavior, especially those within our control, we can actively work to ensure a high degree of match between the customer facing assets and service aspects to the passenger's preferences and needs. Now let's spend some time looking at customer facing assets and our part in helping to contribute to positive customer experience and thereby influence passenger behavior. When looking at station design, some of the key components for consideration are comfort. Are the seats comfortable and functional? Is there free Wi-Fi service available? Are there several charging ports available? This may sound like small things, but it is the small things that matter. Another component is design, which includes overall accessibility, the walkability, and even the architecture. Is it pleasing to the eye? Does it represent elements of the local culture? And is it a space that the community can feel proud about? 
Some of the amenities offered can definitely enhance the travel experience while passengers are traveling through or simply visiting the station as a destination. Some of these amenities may include lounges or working areas, customer service locations and retail places. Continuing on, are there food options for dining and what do they look like? How easy are they to access? Is there a good mix between sit down places and quick service places? Last and most importantly is the safety aspect and perception of this. Are all parts of the stations inside and outside well lit? Is there visible security patrolling the areas? Are the stations clean? And a survey that we conducted, we noted that graffiti and garbage laying around as, as an example around stations were perceived to be unsafe areas. Now let's take a look at this customer facing asset, rolling stock. Similar to stations, there are key components we can influence that can contribute to positive customer experience. This includes providing options for seat types, depending on the trip purpose. Perhaps a family traveling for leisure would like to have seats that face each other so they can easily have conversations. What does the interior design look like? Does it reflect the communities it's serving for style and functionality? Are there standing areas and or cafe places with food and beverage options? What kind of luggage storage is provided and where? Is it overhead or racks in the middle or end of a train? For those using their bikes for first and last mile, is there bike storage and is it easy to use? Are the passenger information systems located in areas where they can easily be seen and read? So we've now just spent some time looking at what factors can influence passenger travel behavior and how we can contribute to positive travel experience through the customer facing assets, stations and trains. With that, I would like to hand it over to my colleague Stefan, who will talk about the customer service aspects, optimization of these services in addition to how to measure and plan for this. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. So with the customer facing service aspects, um, there's obviously a, a, a whole area that um, we need to uh, look at uh, when we are looking at a door to door trip. So the first part is obviously the um, access and egress experience to and from our stations. Um, is it very convenient for people to get to our station? Um, is there um, an, a, a already an existing integrated travel planning and ticketing approach that allows customers um, not having to just look at our mode and then at the at other modes to make it turn from the stations? Is that integration already there? Um, with our uh, service that um, we are providing, um, the customer obviously needs to understand um, when can they travel um, how often do these services operate? Um, how late at night do they operate? And when's the first trip in the morning? How can I get from point to point within my um, desired departure or arrival time interval that, that I'm looking at? Uh, say if somebody goes to a meeting or somebody um, makes a leisure trip and uh, maybe participates in a cultural event, then there's obviously a, a time uh, when the people want to arrive at a given destination. Uh, again, very important for people to have that information in, in front of them before they make a decision and that really impacts in their decision process, which mode they are taking for their um, anticipated travel. Uh, in a lot of cases, if we talk about larger networks of uh, rail or transit service, um, there will be the need for transfers. We can't serve all uh, origin destination pairs with a direct seat uh, or with a direct one seat ride. So with that transfer situation, uh, can we provide a transfer location where the customer feels safe, feels comfortable? Uh, you see a picture here, it's the middle of winter in Germany. If you need to transfer between trains and you literally just walk across the platform from one train into another, then that's a completely different experience than say somebody has to wait on the, the cold platform for five or 10 minutes to make their connection. 
And uh, in general, can we influence how that transfer time is perceived? Um, Madeline talked earlier about the station uh, situation. Uh, can we have amenities where people might be uh, able to get a cup of coffee while they're waiting for the transferring uh, to another train? So that wait time is complete, has a completely different perception than in a situation where you basically literally just need to wait and there's nothing else to do. Um, customer service is very important. Uh, it doesn't matter if that's in a normal operational situation where everything is running on time or in a case where there's cancellations or delays or incidents that are happening. The customer wants to have one point of contact, even though they might be dealing with two, three or four operators between their access and egress modes and then the main mode. So as, uh, the, the more timely we can get information to the customer, either through um, mobile phones or other uh, ways of um, uh, showing information about the current trip, uh, the better. And again, uh, the customer doesn't want to figure out who's who to talk to. We need to have one upfront um, customer service line that they can talk to and either in person or uh, via uh, other media. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the side of the customer uh, trying to make an, or get an understanding of how, what that trip will look like. Um, now, we also have obviously kind of the level of service that, that we call it, um, that we are providing to the customer. So, uh, you know, a given train trip or a, get, a given train journey, um, I label it here as trans, it has all these components. So the local access egress, the main mode or the intercity mode. Um, then we have frequency, fares, trip time, all these parameters that impact uh, how the user will choose between our mode and other competing options that they have. So on the transit side, there um, might be a past experience where users just had an absolute bad experience or an absolute positive experience, and that impacts their decision-making process. If they need to make another choice, what, where to travel and, and how to, what kind of mode to use to get to that uh, destination. Um, with the, the local access, it's typically a separate operator. So we need to ensure that we coordinate with these operators, that we have partnerships with them so that it, for the customer, it appears as to one seed ride uh, from, a, from an environment perspective. So even though they need to use different modes to get to the stations, use our mode and then get from the station somewhere else, um, from an experience perspective, we need to have that coordination so that they feel uh, it's one um, you know, coordinated service offering. Uh, we can impact, obviously, as Madeline showed earlier on the stations and the, the rolling stock side, we can impact our part of that value chain that we are providing to a rider. So that's kind of where we can focus on. But uh, in addition to that, we obviously need to also work with the other operators. Um, from a frequency and time of day perspective, the user looks at both sides of their trip. So they look at um, the, the, the outbound trip to get to a destination, but then also on their return trip. So if we might be offering a very good uh, high frequency service during the morning rush into a given destination, but then if the customer wants to come back at 2.30 in the afternoon and there's a service gap, then that's uh, usually an, an argument for people to say, I need to use another mode because I can't get back in that desired time interval. Trip time, uh, very important. Uh, obviously, um, the user uh, looks at it from an end-to-end -end perspective. So it's not just the time they spend in our stations and our vehicle. They look at the transfer times, they look at the wait times and, and other access egress times. Um, fares are typically in the on the transit and rail side perceived as full out-of-pocket costs, especially if it's single ride trips. Um, so, um, other modes, people don't perceive that cost in the same fashion. If somebody drives their car, they do not perceive that every mile they drive, it's uh, 50 or 60 cents that they are spending in gas and uh, maintenance of their car and so, and, and so on and so forth. So um, very important to understand that if a user um, you know, makes their travel plan, they look at the fare and the price to get from point to point and then compare that against a car um, that they don't really perceive the full cost of that car trip. Uh, the need for transfers, again, uh, we try obviously trying to provide as many uh, single seat rides as we can um, to avoid having people transfer at stations, but 
it, it's in virtually impossible to have that for all passengers. So uh, it obviously increases, say, the anxiety of new users. If I'm not familiar how that transfer works, where it occurs, um, then it might be a big deterrence for me as a new user to using rail. So obviously, we need to work to um, make that transition, that transfer as easy as possible and provide information to people uh, how that uh, transfer takes place. Uh, trip planning, again, this kind of um, is a big umbrella over all of these things. Um, the more information is out there, the, the easier it is to access that information, the better. Um, there's been now various attempts in basically uh, comparing different modal options. Um, there's various um, you know, information sources online that are going in that direction now where you compare auto transit um, 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 traffic or transportation network companies and other um, modal competition. Um, and it kind of, we're getting to that point where there, the, the information is more and more available, but I think there's still a good amount of work to be done on that end. And then in general, the travel information and ticketing, um, there, there are very good uh, improvements already on the way. Uh, but again, it's something that still needs to be um, um, much improved uh, over where it has been a few years ago and um, provide really to the customer that um, you know, one-stop shop that click, buy, and don't have to worry about anything feeling that, that we have in other industries uh, already, and uh, we are working on obviously in the transit industry to get to that point. And then in general, the user perception amenities. What does our service feel like? What, what does it look like? Uh, again, we are, we are providing a mobility service to customers, and that's very important for them to understand and have that good experience. So, and then we need to obviously put all of that in perspective to our competitors. So let it be buses, let it be private car, let it be airlines. And in the future, you know, it might be autonomous vehicles that people might use for longer trips. So all of these parameters have to be looked at in that perspective. So how do we now uh, kind of measure and understand these user preferences when people make the, this, this the, the decision process, which mode to use and when to travel and so on and so forth? So we can obviously go back into historic data sets and say, OK, we know that we've uh, raised fares I don't know, so many years back. Let's have a look at uh, certain customers that have traveled before and after. Uh, did we see a dec decrease in travel activity because uh, prices went up? So that's one example of doing these kind of things. Uh, look at um, maybe gas prices in the past. How have they developed? What was the corresponding reaction on the transit side? Um, the more um, detailed approach is then obviously um, working with revealed and stated user preference surveys. Um, that usually informs uh, choice modeling, so the travel demand modeling uh, efforts that are trying to figure out how much ridership you can get with a change in your system. Um, so um, it kind of uh, goes in, in two directions. One is how did you, users react in the past, and then what would users do if they were uh, facing a change in the system and um, how would they make these trade-offs? So say, what if fares go up, but you also provide a faster service or what if um, you provide a more frequent service, um, but you might have to reduce trip times a little bit because uh, that's the only way to get that frequent service up and running. And then um, we can use statistical methods to then really uh, understand that trade-off process that people make and, and understand what is more important to them, uh, kind of, um, you know, from a perspective of, uh, let it be time or fares uh, or frequency and so on and so forth. And then um, kind of a more direct outreach to people, you know, focus groups, product workshops, market research, um, really getting the opinion of uh, riders that either are new to the system or frequent riders to understand um, where do they see the need for improvements? And then uh, basically extracting that information out of these, uh, these statements and then working towards an improvement in the system. So um, how do we then assess that rider re reaction when we do think about uh, changing our system or improving our system? So there's kind of two um, types of assessments. We can obviously look at near-term uh, changes, and then um, we can also look at longer-term changes. 
So on the near term side, we know the demographics of our riders and the competing uh, or people using our competing modes. We know the uh, user behavior um, based on that information that we can gather. And we have our known supply side and we can anticipate the changes in the supply side, both on our end, as well as then on the competing modes. In the long term side, uh, things are you know, a little different or a little more complex to look at because there could be a change in demographics. Um, there will also likely be a different user behavior or a change in behavior. And there is obviously also a change in the supply side. So both on the rail side, as well as then in, on, on the competing mode side. And we will need to use either forecasts in the demographic side. We probably will have to use some assertions as to understanding how that user behavior changes. And then obviously the planning uh, uh, typically is used or the planning uh, uh, efforts are used to understand the change in supply side, um, service planning for the rail side. And then we obviously know if there's say infrastructure improvements on say the air side or uh, on the highway side. So all of that then can flow into the travel demand modeling efforts, look at financial analysis, benefits assessment, and then we can kind of pick and choose alternatives that we feel um, provide us with the best um, uh, incremental benefits compared to the uh, effort uh, or the investment that's needed to improve the system. And like with any forward looking situation, uh, the further we go away from where we are today, obviously the, the higher that uncertainty becomes because um, you know, 20 years from now, it's very hard to uh, anticipate what will a user reaction be to the same parameters that um, people react to the, today. So there might be changes that, again, uh, um, increase some uncertainty on that end. So in how do we then reflect these customer preferences in rail service? Um, we can obviously start working with the service in the stopping patterns. We can pro prioritize um, high volume markets. We might have uh, express services or skip stop services to serve um, high volume, long distance uh, uh, um, markets. And then we have an overlay with a, a local service that stops everywhere and then provides the accessibility to the local areas. We can optimize one seat rides in the network. So uh, we can focus the lines on, again, higher volume um, OD pairs where we know that there's a lot of people traveling from one station to another station. So we're trying to provide a one seat ride there and then uh, less frequently traveled uh, OD pairs will have to, in certain cases, have a, a transfer uh, in, the, in the service operation. We uh, can look at the trade-off between trip time and connectivity. Again, um, you know, the more stops we have, the better, uh, the better is the accessibility to our rail service because a, a larger share of people could walk there or have a, a much shorter access egress trip. But that, on the other hand, obviously penalizes people that travel longer distances because each stop obviously adds to the trip time of that uh, longer uh, trip. Um, then we have the trade-off between reliability and the actual trip time. So there's obviously a technical or a, a technically feasible trip time uh, that's, uh, if everything goes well, we can go as fast as we can. Um, provides the quickest trip time, but then uh, service planning typically adds in a schedule pad or a buffer so that we can account for irregularities uh, and not uh, arrive late at the destination because of some minor uh, deviations from the normal operation. So obviously the larger this pad is, the more reliability we can produce, but we also uh, increasing the trip time and then uh, we are facing the competition with other modes that might be uh, faster than, than our service. And then last but not least, uh, coordination with the access and egress modes is very important. Uh, working with integrated service schedules, having pulse systems so that at a, say a given minute, um, the long distance service comes into the station, people board in the light, and then the connecting services are leaving the station and you have a minimal transfer time uh, for these access egress trips. So um, all of these improvements obviously differ a little bit between an improved or an existing rail system versus a new rail system. On the improved rail system side, we can obviously be trying to work with uh, run through stations improvements and replacing existing stop and termini. 
So, you know, LA Union Station, for instance, is one example. Uh, San Francisco is looking at Link 21. Boston, for instance, has been looking at the North-South Rail Link for a while. Um, we can prioritize transfers in, in high demand lines. So um, we can say, uh, if, if we need to uh, have a transfer, then let's uh, pick a, a, a OD pair that um, has a, a lower ridership than, than other station pairs where we know that there's a lot of um, demand uh, that we want to serve with a single seat ride. Tariff fare integration, so we don't need to worry about access egress trips anymore. Uh, travel information systems, um, and then change in the time of day service patterns, and then coordination again of the access and egress modes. These are all things that can, a lot of them can be done without a large amount of investment. Uh, it's basically just changing the, the, the system. Um, because you know any rail system that's once it's built, it's a huge investment, and it's very very hard to then adapt it or modify it later on, uh, um, because it's obviously typically these things have grown historically over decades, and then uh, we need to um, try to make the best out of it. Uh, if we do build new systems, then obviously you know we want to optimize that new system for the existing markets, but also for a kind of anticipated changes in these key markets in the future. Um, we wanna allow for expansions and modifications to address any future changes. And then obviously a new system um, needs to fill that gap in the existing service offerings of the competing modes. And then last but not least, uh, the integration with the existing operators again, because it doesn't help us if we build a station in the middle of nowhere, if people don't have a ways to uh, um, accessing that station for the trip to a longer destination. So in summary, um, we, we, as we discussed now through the couple, a couple times here, uh, we know the demographics of our users. We understand from where to where they go today. We understand their behavior. Um, and we kind of have a you know, pretty good handle on our competing modes as well. We understand how people use these other modes um, and um, how that trade-off is being made. For us on the rail side, um, as we heard earlier from Madeline, stations, the rolling stock, that appearance, that feel is a key component of the user once they've made that experience. Um, if it's good experience, then they come back. If it's a bad experience, they might choose another mode. The same on the customer service and the, the operating uh, side of things. If we provide consistent service, if, it's, uh, if it has a high on-time performance, um, and if the, the riders feel that they have one point of contact, uh, if things do not go according to plan, then that, all of that together very much uh, helps the rider to make a decision for rails transportation uh, rather than uh, any of the competing modes. Um, so with that, um, I think I'll turn it back to Chris for any questions. That we have, that we have. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And if you could unshare your screen, uh, give me uh, a second. <laughs> uh, ah, okay. Sorry, that's a different screen. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. So I have a question that popped up as you were talking that may or may not be within the scope of this presentation, but. Um, there's, I've been reading a, a guy's blog recently, and he, he talked about, um, let me just ask it a different way. So DB has focused on creating an integrated network with uh, clock phase schedules, so that you make sure that the trains run at the same time every hour, they all meet at key transfer points so that you can transfer between those, et cetera. Um, SNCF on the TGV network is focused on segmenting the markets. So they have some trains that go really fast with first class, which we would probably call business class and, and coach. And then they have some trains that only have economy coach and they've got trains that, you know, target specific cities that are on the network. Um, and so, it's been frustrating because I, uh, getting my opinion into it, I've been frustrated that Amtrak is focused on segmentation between Northeast Regional and Acela. But getting back to the France versus DB comparison, 
What are your views on segmenting it versus providing a, a highly frequent connected network? Yeah, um, Marilyn, you want me to take it first? Okay. So I think, um, well, first of all, I think we need to look at a little bit at the uh, historical context in both uh, situations, right? So uh, in Germany, um, DB Fernverkehr, which is the long distance operation of DB is a, um, I call it a revenue risk operation. So um, the, that's an operation that's uh, subject to competition, whereas then the regional services um, are, um, basically operating contracts on behalf of the different states in Germany. And um, so that's kind of the, the, the difference there. Uh, DB offers also call them uh, express or sprinter services in the long distance markets. So there's a little bit of that market segmentation. You obviously want to capture a uh, high volume market. So say if you have a high volume market from Berlin to Munich for say business travelers or, or um, long distance commuters that might on a Friday night uh, travel from work from the workplace back home and then Sunday night from the from the home location back to their work location, you, you want to capture those markets. And um, I think you can pretty much achieve both. Um, so uh, using a pulse system or pulse schedule uh, approach doesn't prevent you from serving specific markets um, with say um, express services or different types of services, as long as you can still fit within this larger grid of the, the, the pulse system, right? Because you, your slotting in a pulse system is obviously kind of a repetitive pattern and so as long as your express service still fits in there, I think you can work with both. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, if it's a private sector operation, then obviously the operator chooses their service concept with the, where they feel they can capture the majority of the market or where they feel they can serve markets according to, um, you know, their trade-offs between what type of service they're providing versus what kind of fare they can get for that and so on and so forth. I mean, it's a little similar than in the airline market, right? Where you have uh, obviously similar situations. Uh, do, do you have a, a, a direct um, airport to airport connection or do you have to have a, a layover somewhere? And it's kind of a similar situation there where the airlines obviously need to make that, that decision as well. Yeah, the difference being airlines are fairly low volume businesses, right? Whereas railroads are, are higher volume and connecting many more points and so it it becomes an interesting discussion but thank you for that that uh, that viewpoint Chris are there any questions from the audience um we still uh, have we can take uh, take more questions uh please you know put them in the Q a uh, if you have any um, I had a couple actually you know while we give people a chance to you know to think about other questions um, I was wondering um, has what passengers expect? changed during your careers or over a longer period of time? And, and if so, how? I think this goes back to, you know, so the example that I had provided, um, where in our experience in our past, we were seeing that um, travel typically, you know, would be carrying passengers from suburban areas and then just ending in downtown. But then as uh, populations grew, um, sometimes cost of living couldn't be supported and therefore expanded out outside of that geography. Um, so when that happened, the trip distances now became longer all of a sudden. And when that happened, that triggered the need for, well, you know, if I'm going to be sitting on this train for much longer, maybe I really want to be able to do more work or somehow be more productive just depending on who's actually riding the train and so that's what we've seen um, which has then driven what um, those passengers are looking for as they are riding these longer trips just more amenities to accommodate that longer trip time okay and uh at, at least in some places uh train travel fell out of favor for a while to some extent and i was wondering if, if you've seen successful turnaround stories uh and and if so did attention to the factors that you both explained today play a role in that um i think um that statement is 
pretty much true for any country in the world, right? I mean, even in, in Germany, um, you know, at, at some point in time, I would say 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, uh, there was uh, for a while a, a really a, um, a significant change of how people looked at rail travel. I mean, it was more like kind of, okay, if I have to take rail, I'll, I'll take rail. And then meanwhile, I think it's, it's the pendulum swung in the other direction where um, people see it as, you know, the, the go-to option first. And then just in certain circumstances where it, the trip time might just be too long, they still kind of um, choose an, an airline trip instead uh, or choose a private car trip because, I don't know, maybe they're going on vacation and have a lot of stuff to carry around. So. Um, that obviously is is an argument that they might be taking a car instead. So I think in, in general, um, right now, uh, at least Europe, and then I would say that's true for the US as well, between um, climate change and trying to address it, uh, trying to get to zero emissions travel options, I think uh, rail is just more and more coming in the foreground as is kind of providing that that option right now. Or at least low emission. Uh, if if you even if you still have to use some 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 diesel diesel propulsion to get people around town, um, I I think it's it's you know as with any market, it, there's always ups and downs. But I think right now we're in a very good situation where where that um, perception of of rail travel as well as the the, the convenience is getting more and more in the direction where people uh, accept it as, as a really preferred mode of, of transportation. And, um, you know, information or the availability of information um, did a big part of that or helped uh, very much in, in that change in perception. Uh, whereas in the past, I mean, I remember having to pretty much get a, a printed little booklet uh, at the train station to understand what the schedule looks like. And then if you need to make a trip, then you need to find a booklet. Okay, when's the train leave and how do you make a connection? Today, you literally can go on your cell phone and, or, or computer and or whatever modern media you, you're working with. And you have that information in a few seconds uh, with a few clicks. So that availability is, I think, uh, uh, very much a fundamental, um, um, a fundamental um, necessity for people to understand their options. And then um, if we now can also tell people, hey, if you drive at $6 a gallon uh, for 100 miles, uh, just look at the gas consumption and look at what that costs you, then uh, I would say very quickly, people say, well, if the bus is five bucks for a 30 mile trip and um, I use a, a, a gallon of gas uh, at $6, um, then you know the people might make different choices as well. So I think that information component has contributed a lot to that you know um, shift towards uh, rail and understanding that that's uh, in a lot of cases a very, a very convenient option for people. You know, I, I have to comment because uh, you talk about how there used to be this book and you had to figure out, and it it was kind of fun to try to figure out where the trains were until you really were in a hurry and you had to to actually find the right schedule. But I've gotten a number of complaints recently from older folks about, I can't get my schedule book. How can people know when the train is if they don't have their schedule book? Like, well, it's easier to do it on the internet. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe this says something about my age, but I feel that way now too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, oh. Question. We, we, yeah, we have a uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in from the audience now. Thank you. Um, and uh, and this one from Sylvia, you know, may uh, sort of uh, or I think it does touch on uh, what Stefan was just talking about about reducing emissions. Um, so I, I don't know whether there's more to say here, but um, she asks, uh, where is the customer preference for the cleanest mode of mass transportation as well as the most sociable? And and she says, for me and many others, the biosphere and social impact of my travel choice is the most important criteria. Anything more you'd like to add there? I mean, um, Madeline, I guess, touched a little bit on that uh, with the, the rolling stock. So obviously, you know, having rolling stock that's flexible enough to have, maybe we have a quiet car where the business traveler can uh, work while they're traveling, uh, have a, 
a car where, where people can socialize, um, um, you know, have a, a dining car or a cafe car where you can grab uh, some breakfast or you can, you know, socialize after work. Um, I can give you a little, uh, a little anecdote from my trip when I worked on the East Coast. I worked in Connecticut for a while. Uh, uh, took Shoreline East there. There was a group of um, daily commuters that literally on the way back, they bought their cheese platter, they had their drinks with them and had a totally good time in the train back. So, you know, these kind of things are obviously, yes, they, they, they do influence what type of mode people use and then based on their specific uh, situation, I think it's, uh, it's very important that, that rail uh, transportation is flexible enough and, uh, you know, um, I mean, there were advertisements that Amtrak doesn't provide middle seats, which, you know, airlines do. So, um, and, and um, that, that kind of perception, I'm sure, is, is in a lot of cases a key component of how people choose. And um, um, the more we can address that in, in our environment that we provide to, to users, the better. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and I don't know uh, how familiar either of you are with the Chicago area, but we have a question from Alan uh, about, about this, this part of the country. Uh, using the Chicago metro area, metro area as an example, are there creative ways to connect with regional rail without having to first travel to a city center? I guess I... I'm not too familiar with Chicago, but um, I think it's one of those cases where you have historically these kind of more termini stations and kind of had radio lines leading into the city center. And now because this whole urban area kind of, again, is morphing more into a polycentric, a polycentric system. And so I guess, um, other cities in Europe, uh, for instance, Berlin, um, they have started working on kind of um, call it um, uh, ring railroads that kind of connect these radial arms uh, leading into the city center with kind of a, uh, um, a, a, a half ring or ring uh, type of uh, alignment that then allows transfers between these um, services so that people don't have to go downtown and then back out. So. Um, again, it really depends on the region if something like that is feasible or not. Um, uh, Chicago, on top of everything else, is obviously very dominated by freight uh, operations. So if there, are, if there is trackage available, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the freight railroads already you know, utilize that capacity um, uh, to, to, to the maximum. So um, because they're you know, probably facing similar situations where instead of rolling everything into a hub, you might want to have certain movements that go um, in different locations without having to first go to downtown. So um, I don't know if that uh, helps or if that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think so. Rick, anything to add since uh, you- I, I, I've been working on a, a topic for a webinar that, that I will do in the near future. So uh, look for that. Great, <laughs> stay tuned. Uh, we have a, another question from Roger who asks, can you describe effective approaches to getting multiple providers to collaborate on things like transfers and integrated fares, uh, especially between government operators that seem to prefer to compete? Uh, so let me again bring an example from Germany. Um, I grew up and worked in the state of Bavaria there for quite some time. Um, the way services are being procured there, they are by partial networks. So the state doesn't um, ask for uh, an operator to run the entire network in the entire state. Uh, the state basically asks for sub-networks and um, the state very much um, is kind of the driving force behind that, that pulse schedule uh, or that net integrated network plan and that defines exactly at which arrival departure minutes train move, trains move between the different stations. And um, by doing that planning up front, like, um, basically not thinking about which operator is doing what, it's, it's kind of a master uh, schedule or a master plan for the schedule. Um, and then once that is established, then you can, you know, start 
working with parts of the network where you say, okay, we are putting this up for bidding now. Uh, operator X, you come in and run that on our behalf. Um, and then um, you have performance regimes or performance criteria that say you need to provide these and these connections. Uh, you need to have that on that transfer time in so many percent of the cases. If you don't, if you're constantly late, um, you get penalized. If you have higher connectivity or better connectivity, you get um, bonus payment. So, you know, there are contractual mechanisms in place that that kind of trying to uh, ensure that. And, um, you know, I mean, there are obviously experiences that didn't go well at all. And um, but in the majority of cases, uh, that kind of approach really um, um, did the, the trick for the majority of cases. And, and um, um, again, I think it, it all boils down to that integrated planning approach up front. And then, you know, uh, you can't just make a wholesale change in a system. These things have evolved over decades. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a, another question from Fred about overnight sleeper service. Um, it, have any of the you know the factors that you've described the you know the planning, the integration, the amenities? Uh, does any of that change uh, when we're talking about overnight service, or is there anything that you'd like to say about that? Yeah, definitely. So, um, the longer uh, you know a trip is, then um, the need for uh, comfort and in this case potentially having availability the, the options of sleeper cars um, but then it comes down to understanding the the trade-offs there because while on the surface it may seem like a good idea it's still something worth really trying to understand in terms of okay a passenger may want this but uh, would they be willing to spend whatever the cost is to have access to reserving such sleeper car so um, it's definitely something that we've also looked at, again, triggered by the, the length of the distance of the trip to begin with, because if it's, it's a shorter distance, then probably you're not going to see that on there. But for longer distance services, it's something we would look at. Stefan? Yeah, I mean, you might have heard about the, I would say, recent developments the last three, four years in Germany for... Um, I think about four or five years ago, pretty much the entire uh, night train network of trains between the different European countries pretty much disappeared overnight. Um, and um, just last two or three years, there were um, was kind of a re resurgence of these night services. And that kind of ties in probably a little bit then with that market separation that you uh, asked about earlier. So, um, you know, obviously a rail operator can't just run trains for the sake of running to trains. I mean, if you have only five people in an in a eight or 10 car train, uh, then it's not economical or it's not financially feasible. So um, with, high, with the introduction of high-speed rail, a lot of these station-to-station -station pairs that, you know, were in that category of being well-served with overnight trains, say nine, 10, 12 hour trip times overnight, uh, where you board the train at seven or eight or nine o'clock at night, the one day, and then you arrive uh, in the morning at the, the other city center. Um, all of these things, um, you know, were changed as, as soon as you had high-speed rail in the game where the same trip could be done in the three or three and a half hour day trip. And so with that, you're basically shifting the market from one service to another. Um, however, you know, in the last few years now um, in Europe, there's a new market that is that kind of evolved uh, where people um, basically um, um, decelerated their trip making, right? So they, they very much uh, uh, now say, okay, I do, I do want to use that eight or nine hour uh, slot that, that's, that it takes to do the longer trip. Um, and I can sleep while I'm traveling, and um, then I'm, you know, arriving in, a, in a, a city in the morning and can do my leisure activities on my business trip or whatever I'm, I'm traveling for. So that that kind of change, and again, it's a change in behavior. It's a change in perception of uh, how people use that time you know, on the train. And so these things evolve and these things change. So ten years from now, there might be a, a, a you know much improved uh, overnight service than. Than we're seeing today so 
Okay, thank you. What about, uh, is there more to say about accessibility? John asks, are there efforts to provide wayside and trackside accessibility tools for hearing and sight impaired travelers? Um, maybe I'll start and then maybe Madeline can chime in. So, I mean, obviously it's it ties a little bit into the, um, the slide I had earlier with existing services versus um, establishing a new system, right? So um, everywhere, obviously people strive to um, having accessible stations and when you have an, when you're building a new system, then that is much easier to implement because you can do that by design. Um, however, I would say the majority of systems um, have grown since the late 1900s into what they are today. So in a lot of cases, um, it it takes a lot of effort in changing the existing station situations. Um, changing platform configurations uh, in a way that you can really have uh, accessible stations. So um, even in Germany, you have different platform height standards. Uh, there's different standards for uh, rapid transit systems. There's different standards for long distance services and then for regional and, and local services. So, um, and then as you can imagine, as these vehicles travel from different types of stations, um, you're dealing with this platform height difference and uh, even in the urban transit systems, you have these issues. So I think all agencies and operators are working very hard trying to get to that point, trying to get to fully accessible stations, but it's just a very, very um, long-term strategy that needs to be uh, deployed there. And um, as with any investment in rail infrastructure, it's a lot of um, capital cost that is typically needed to really get them things to a common standard so and then oh, i would just I, sorry. Oh, sorry oh i would just add that therefore it is an opportunity right now as stations are being um if they're not even existing yet you know um to implement this in the design phase but for those stations that are existing today and being redesigned it's an opportunity to be implementing these improvements so okay we, uh, I see there's a, a follow-up uh, question to this um, from the person who asked it, um, asking for less about, uh, or saying that it was not so much about physical facilities, but about passenger information assistance through mobile devices or, or other means to help passengers on their way through a journey. Um, is there is there any uh, anything that you can add about that? Um. I'm aware of a few approaches where basically um, smart devices like cell phones um, are used to um, basically um, use them as guidance to walking through stations or um, you know basically providing um, um, audio updates uh, for for people say that visually impaired or having um, other uh, ways of communicating uh, things like that. So I think as as you know as all industries, not just the rail or transit, but all industries are moving more and more to um, massive amounts of data on buildings, on on infrastructure, on services, um, utilizing that wealth of information and then uh, deriving um, helping tools uh, for customers, I think is is probably something that, shouldn't be too far out in, in from, from where we are today. Um, so building information management, uh, BIM, uh, is one of those components where currently I think it's mostly used on the, the design side of things, on the, the infrastructure and asset management side of things. But um, I think it's not a far stretch at all to saying, OK, now we have a digital model of our station. Why can't we utilize that to kind of have a virtual guide for somebody that um, say it's visually impaired or somebody that that needs assistance in navigating through a station. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, and can we do one more? Okay.
Thanks. Uh, so, and, and I know this talk already touched on the, the difficulty of uh, projecting further into the future. The further into the future you look, uh, the harder it becomes. But um, we have a question uh, about this, essentially about the trajectory of the, the pandemic um, from in Inara, who asks, after COVID, uh, many people changed their ways of working. And at least in the UK, only 60% of passengers, at least so far, have returned to the railways. Uh, what do you think uh, these changes in in behavior will will mean? So I I can start and then I mean, so yes, we don't have a crystal ball, but um, how what we can do to address that is um, by maintaining this flexibility in in the service plan offerings that actually match now what we're seeing in. Um, the workers not fully yet going back, you know, into work. Um, keeping watching those trends over time and seeing what that looks like, so that we could be flexible enough to adapt um, these different service schedules. So, Stefan, I'll hand it over to you. But that's just what I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, definitely, service schedules are, are again one of the uh, measures you can implement without having to, you know. Um, Build additional infrastructure or modify infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, I guess we'll need to see where things, how things are evolving. Um, you know, it, you hear people um, saying, "I'm not going back to the office," and you hear employers saying, "You need to be back to the office." So, you know, it's it's going to be an evolving process. I'm sure we'll not be at the same point that we were in 2019 before the pandemic. Uh, even in three or four years out, um, that will definitely be not the case. Um, but I think we we will need to adapt that we will be serving different markets. I mean, if you look at the uh, the um, the airline industry, um, I think uh, a lot of the the, the volumes and flights uh, is coming back or being close now to where it was before uh, the pandemic. But I think the trip purposes are just different. It's it's either leisure trips or it's a mix of business and leisure trip or um, um, things things on that end have evolved as well. And um, so on the on the rail side, you know, I think and then all of the systems are already doing it, and they have to uh, take uh, stock of uh, what their new riders look like, and then they need to adapt their service program from that. And yes, we might not need the 10 car, you know, bi-level, um, high volume uh, inbound um, or morning peak um, uh, rail services uh, to that degree anymore because that morning rush is uh, much more um, um, or is much less than, than it was before the pandemic. Um, but we do might need now additional service that leaves at 12, one or two o'clock in the afternoon outbound already because People might be only in the office for half a day, um, or uh, we might need um, now um, service that that caters to specific um, leisure activities, where before people just didn't have the opportunity to make a leisure trip during the middle of the week because they were working in the, the downtown area. Now they might be having a different work pattern where there might be an opportunity for to just to take a day, half a day, and and go for a leisure activity and. Um, uh, if they can do that by train, then the, the, the better. So, so I think that's kind of the, the key where um, uh, everybody needs to kind of recognize that there's a, a change and, and it's an evolving change uh, in user uh, patterns, in, in user, the, when people travel and for what purposes they travel, and then we need to cater uh, to that kind of change and uh, optimize our systems. Okay. Well, thank you both, uh, Madeline and, and Stefan, um, and thank you to everyone in the audience who asked questions. Um, Rick, any uh, any uh, words in, in closing? Oh, yeah, you're you're on uh, mute again. <laughs> thank you very much. This this was really informative. I, I really appreciate those graphics at the beginning, um, and and DB's commitment to helping educate folks across the states about how high speed rail works. So. I appreciate you coming today. And for all of those who have who enjoyed it, please go to highspeedrail.us and go in the upper hand corner and click donate. 
um, in order to support this and to make sure that we can have other quality meetings like this as well. So thank you all, goodbye.